Welcome back to Comfish Alaska 2021. We have reached our second to last presentation of the day. As you might recall, we had some technical difficulties and so the state legislative update with Representative Stutz is now going to be occurring at four o'clock today. But let's go ahead and get on with the business at hand. And so by now I'm sure that you're that, that you've heard me say that if you're joining us on YouTube or Facebook, you're really not getting the complete Comfish Alaska experience. So go ahead and visit comfishak.com to register and attend this fully interactive event. It's such a social place. So for those joining us on Hopin, please go ahead and submit questions during these forums on the forum stage uh, chat under the Q&A portion. From there, the moderator, myself, will go ahead and let any of the presenters know the questions that you have. Uh, after the presentation, be sure to join us at some of those expo booths and through the sessions and video chat. But on to our next forum today, which is Seeking Permanent Protections for Bristol Bay. So please join me in welcoming Andy Link, Lindsay Leyland, and Catherine Karskalen. Uh, as a well-known Alaska seafood economist, Andy Wink has been at the helm of the Bristol Bay Regional Seafood Development Association since 2018. The BBRSDA is a fleet-funded association which strives to advance the quality and market success of Bristol Bay salmon, address fishery-related infrastructure requirements in the Bristol Bay region, and create research and education programs to ensure the long-term success of the world's largest and most valuable salmon fishery. Andy has over 10 years of experience in researching and analyzing the Alaska seafood industry and carries an extensive knowledge of the entire supply chain to his work at BBRSDA. Lindsay Leyland is the Deputy Director of the United Tribes of Bristol Bay and a lifelong set net fisherman com committed to community engagement and preparing and encouraging future generations to lead empowered, sustainable, productive lives. The first of its kind, UTBB, is a tribally charted consortium working to conserve the region's pristine salmon habitat and traditional ways of life of the indigenous peoples that called Bristol Bay home. Lindsay's efforts focus on halting unsustainable mining projects that threaten this watershed, such as the proposed pebble mine. Catherine Karskallen is a lifelong resident of Bristol Bay, raised in a generational fishing family. She captains a commercial drift fishing boat, the fishing vessel Seahawk, making a living as part of the long longest lasting sustainable salmon fishery in the world. She has worked actively for over a decade to raise awareness about the threat the proposed pebble mine poses in Bristol Bay and currently serves as executive director of Commercial Fishermen for Bristol Bay, a national coalition of fishermen dedicated to protecting Alaska's greatest wild salmon fishery and the land and waters that sustain it. Thank you so much for joining us and I'll let you go ahead and get started with your presentation. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and, and really thank you to the whole team for putting, for making Kodiak Comfish happen this year. I know we'd all love to be there. I miss Kodiak, I miss the sushi and everything else Comfish normally has to offer, but this is a really great alternative given the circumstances. So we really appreciate it. Um, I think if we just flip to this next slide, I just wanna go over what we're going to cover this afternoon. Um, first off, Andy's going to cover the economic benefits of Bristol Bay and Really our groups commissioned McKinley Research to conduct this new report, really just to update to update the numbers on Bristol Bay and make sure we're giving an accurate depiction of our fishery. And I think all of us who participate in the fisheries know there really is no way to put a number on the real value of subsistence or a commercial fishery that is sustainable and really provides for generations and generations. But this is an attempt to at least put a number and, and really be able to answer to the arguments the pebble mine have been putting forward for years that that the mine would create jobs and economic benefit for alaska we really need solid numbers to combat those arguments um we'll also update you on the latest that's happening with pebble mine um the status of their permit and the call for permanent protections for bristol bay and then we'll have some time at the end for a q a and of course what you can do to help so andy wink if you want to take it away Sure. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so 
you know, starting off with the, you know, the, this presentation on protections for Bristol Bay, um, I want to walk you guys through some of the new numbers um, that have been compiled by um, uh, McKinley Research, formerly McDowell Group, uh, my old job actually. Um, and these were just released a couple weeks ago. And I think they'll do a really good job of, you know, at least in dollars and cents terms, explaining why it is so important to protect uh, Bristol Bay salmon habitat. So kind of jumping right into it here. Um, this is, uh, you know, the, the big number that pops out is, you know, total economic benefits uh, in excess of $2.2 billion. And so I think one of the questions I get asked as an economist sometimes is, you know, what do you mean by economic output or economic benef benefits? Um, and really what that pertains to is a, a measure of total economic activity, in this case, based on Bristol Bay salmon. And it's comprised of direct, indirect, and induced impacts. And so direct impacts are gonna be everything that um, is directly involved with catching and cutting the fish um, and getting them to market, you know, everything directly involved with the supply chain. Um, indirect uh, effects are things that are really business to business. So a fisherman buying nets or getting fuel um, or a processor, uh, you know, getting people on planes to move, move workers around. Those are all indirect effects. And then finally, induced effects is what happens when people spend their earnings in, in the community. So maybe it's uh, someone, you know, paying their mortgage or buying groceries or taking a vacation. Um, all of those things create uh, economic activity and jobs elsewhere in the economy, and those are what we refer to as induced effects. So um, we'll break these numbers down a little bit more as we go through this, but um, the seafood industry total output was 2 billion in 2019 and tourism added um, another 200 million. Um, but I wanna talk a little bit about subsistence before we you know, talk mostly about the, the commercial seafood industry. Um, subsistence is not included in this $2.2 billion figure, uh, but it does have a tremendous value in both in economic terms and cultural significance. Um, in, in economic terms, the, the subsistence salmon, salmon harvest, sorry, that's a tongue twister. Um, the subsistence salmon harvest is worth roughly five to $10 million. Um, and that works out to about 4,500 to $9,000 per household uh, in the region. Um, so. You know, but beyond that, I'd say the cultural value, you know, is is really it, it's unquantifiable, but it's probably even more significant. Um, virtually every household uh, in Bristol Bay consumes subsistence salmon either by harvesting it or uh, receiving it from, from someone else, bartering, sharing. Um, it's you know, it's really a foundational uh, part of life in Bristol Bay. So. Moving on to talk about the seafood industry more specifically, um, like I said, $2 billion of total economic output, $830 million of labor income. And labor income is gonna be your salaries, your wages, commissions, profits, um, all that stuff that is, is really income less costs. Um, so that's a kind of an easier number for us to wrap our head around uh, as opposed to economic output. Um, and so, you know, just to give this, this $830 million some context, uh, that is roughly the same labor income, or th that's roughly the same amount as what is earned by all of Alaska's oil and gas uh, extraction workers um, in terms of their wages and salaries. Not oil field services, but actual extraction. And as we all know, that is really big in Alaska, um, as is Bristol Bay's uh, commercial salmon industry. Um, in terms of the employment, you know, 15,000 annualized jobs. Um, it's important to note that this is not numbers of workers because this is a very seasonal fishery. Uh, this is kind of works out more to like an average monthly employment figure. Um, but with 15,000 jobs, that is roughly the same amount as employment as all of the federal government employees uh, in Alaska. So. Um, I will just point out that, you know, these numbers are what Bristol Bay's salmon, uh, commercial, commercially caught salmon, mean to the entire country, but just for you guys to try to 
wrap your head around the context here and the size. Very significant, obviously. Um, going kind of looking at this a few different ways, sort of by sector of the seafood industry as well as by, by residency. Um, Alaska is comprised a little over half of the harvesting fleet. As you can see, 4,500 uh, Alaska residents. Um, slightly less than half of that comes from local, uh, you know, people that live locally in Bristol Bay and participate in the fishery. Um, the employment and the, the $372 million in fishery value, you know, that's, that's what leads to the $2.2 .2 billion. So, you know, sometimes we see, um, oh, prices or economic terms thrown around, and you have to be careful about understanding at what point in the chain you're talking about, if that's the very end or the, or the beginning in this case, uh, w you know, which is ex-vessel value and the payments made to fishermen. Um, so a whole lot of business and jobs and commerce is built uh, upon this, this fishery, obviously. And the, again, if there are any questions on this, I think we can hold them to the end, but um, I'm just gonna keep keep working through this and uh, and we'll come back to, to any questions that people may have with, with the slides. So on the processing side, the processing industry in Bristol Bay employs about 6,000 uh, seasonal workers. The vast majority of those are non-residents. It, it takes a huge amount of people, both to catch all this fish and to process it, you know, get it, frozen, get it canned, or get it shipped out fresh. Um, it's really an, an incredible challenge to mobilize this, this workforce. And I'd say even more so, um, I, you know, a figure I thought that was interesting in this report was, you know, roughly 17% of processing workers had over five years experience. And I know from talking to processing, uh, uh, processing plant managers that there's, there's a lot of turnover you know, because this only happens a few months out of the year, you tend not to get as many people um, coming back each year. You know, if it's a 12 month, uh, or, you know, if it's a 12 month a year operation, you're just more likely to have kind of full time year round staff. And, you know, that one year leads into another. But Bristol Bay is very different. And so it's a huge um, undertaking to you know, assemble this this workforce each year with a lot of new faces and get them trained and get them um, able to process, you know, uh, hundreds of millions of pounds of, of salmon. Um, so, but again, on the numbers here uh, in 2019, or excuse me, this is a 2015 and 2019 average, averaged at 137 million pounds of processed product uh, with a wholesale value of 540 million. 2019 was a more valuable year, good harvest, good prices. And so we saw that value tick up to 710 million. Um, I think that, you know, the main point to, to make with regard to both harvesting and processing is, is even though there can be some strife back and forth, sometimes that, you know, the harvesting sector needs the processing sector and vice versa. This fishery just does not work, uh, you know, uh, without the other. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, obviously a lot of employment and um, jobs that are created on both sides of that. So in terms of the impacts within Alaska, uh, total economic output of 990 million. Um, and uh, the commercial fishing activity resulted in $294 million of direct labor income with processing adding another 81 million. Um, you can kind of see the splits there uh, at the bottom between resident versus non-resident fishermen. Um, you know, trying to add some context to the, to the figures at the bottom right, uh, you know, three, a total of 375 million in total labor income. Well, that is uh, slightly more than all of the wages and salaries earned in the non-oil and gas uh, mining sector uh, uh, in Alaska, um, or about the same size as the Ketchikan borough in terms of wage and salary uh, uh, income. Um, employment, 
Uh, that 5,370 uh, annualized jobs, that works out to about 1% of all of Alaska's employment, which is pretty significant You know, when you're talking about something as big as Alaska's entire economy. And uh, it's also about, it's slightly more than twice the employment in Alaska's non-oil and gas uh, mining sector as well. Um, so, you know, I guess depending on the context, 5,000 jobs might sound like a ton or not that much, but it, in the context of Alaska, it is very significant. Um, you know, and also included in these figures is uh, tax revenue as well. And about 11 million of that goes to uh, local Bristol Bay uh, governments, uh, local governments in the region, and then another 5 million to the state. And that's actually a pretty good return on investment for the state because it takes around $2 million to manage, uh, to manage the fishery sustainably. And so there's, there's net benefits from that as well, both at the local and state level. And then looking further down south for the economic impacts in the Pacific Northwest, you can see 800 million uh, in indirect and induced impacts and uh, 370 million comes from the seafood industry there. Uh, you know, again, a lot of employment happens in the Pacific Northwest as people do business with companies in, in that area, as people spend earnings in that area. Uh, obviously there's a lot of fishermen that are from there, a lot of processing workers as well. And so that creates a lot of jobs in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and then on the other side of the slide, you can see that there's, uh, they've, McKinley has also uh, estimated the number of jobs that happen in the rest of the US. And certainly that's not as much, but we wouldn't expect it to be, um, you know, but still almost 2000 jobs across the rest of the US is, is substantial. And really, you know, the benefits and the, 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 the jobs and the income that come from Bristol Bay are really widely distributed. I mean, it's sold in virtually every state, at least every state that we're aware of, um, or it goes through those states. And we have permit holders and crew members that live, um, I think the last count was 48 states. Um, it, you know, and, and we can only count about half the crew members, frankly, because we don't have complete coverage on that. Um, just the way those, those crew licenses are uh, uh, come in, it, can't always pin them down to one fishery, but um, very widely distributed benefits, obviously concentrated in Alaska and in the Pacific Northwest. Um, keep moving on here. So this table shows uh, the sockeye harvests back to 2010. Um, when the report came out, I don't, they didn't, I guess, include 2020 in it, but uh, but still, you can see Bristol Bay has had a really good run of, of sockeye harvests lately. Um, escapement goals have been met. I can't remember off the top of my head how far back it's been since we didn't meet an escapement goal, but it's it's been a really fantastic run in terms of sustainable harvest of sockeye in Bristol Bay. And sockeye, for anyone on this <laughs> presentation who's not aware, you know, it's really unique in that in Bristol Bay, sockeye is usually 95, 97% or more of the salmon harvest. Um, it's really dominated by one species, which happens to be a, a very premium salmon species and does all that without any hatcheries. Uh, it's really amazing. So, so that's, that's the volume. And then looking at the value of that, the ex vessel value, you can also see that those numbers have increased uh, quite a bit as well, uh, the middle column there. Um, and we saw a fishery value of 372 million in 2019. That's up from kind of the low point of 2015 of 125 million. And then you can see, you know, first wholesale value there on the right. Uh, just in case folks aren't aware, I'll just point out you know, X vessel value is included in first wholesale value. Um, so if you were to sort of subtract those two, you'd kind of understand what each, uh, you know, what the harvesting sector retains in terms of revenue and what the 
what the processors retain in terms of revenue, less what they pay fishermen. And you know that's been working out to between I'd say 40 to 55 percent over the last 15 years. Uh, you know, fishermen tending to get 45 to 60 percent. There's a few years where it can be outside of that range, um, but that's typically what we see. And so, you know, one, I'm really glad that this chart was was in here and Catherine actually did a great job putting these slides together. Um, and this is one that I think, you know, whether you fish in Bristol Bay or not, you really got to pay attention to because, you know, Bristol Bay has been kind of the shining star of the salmon fisheries in Alaska for the last um, several years, or at least going back to, I'd say 2016, 2017. And in 2018, in 2019, it was over 50% of Alaska's entire uh, salmon value in, you know, from the commercial harvest. And once the numbers are finalized, I'm very sure that 2020 will also be over 50% as well. So you know, what we have here is one of Alaska's many salmon fishing regions you know, just producing a huge <clears throat> share of, of the value and uh, that has that has benefits for the entire industry. It gives it enough scale to be able to operate in other areas, um, you know. And so I think it really does a lot of good things for Alaska overall, uh, not just the bay. And it's you know I I guess I it's hard to quantify what the Alaska salmon industry would be without Bristol Bay, um, it, you know, over the last three years. But obviously, it would it would be in much worse shape uh, uh, than it is, uh, you know, if not for some really robust harvest in Bristol Bay. And so, I think that's important to keep in our minds as we think about, you know, protections for Bristol Bay. And if those protections aren't there, you you know, it's not hyperbole to say that the entire Alaska salmon industry is at risk. Um, so, just to recap. Some of the numbers that you know you probably want to uh, try to remember from this presentation: uh, 2.2 billion dollars in economic output. We talked about what you know what that figure means, uh, what output is. Uh, 830 million dollars in labor income, 15,000 American jobs, a little bit over 5,000 of those that take place uh, within Alaska, and you know beyond jobs and income. The, this incredible Bristol Bay salmon run allows the seafood industry to feed uh, healthy protein to people around the world. It allows the tourism industry to share the magic of a pristine watershed with, with visitors. And it allows local communities to continue a cultural subsistence salmon harvest that have sustained native peoples there for, for millennia. And, you know, while those aspects aren't economic in nature um, so much, you know, they're really unique and special, I think, and um, just are not found as commonly elsewhere in the world. And so this is, you know, from a dollars and cents standpoint, and just a, I'd say human and ecological legacy standpoint, this is most definitely a resource worth protecting. So um, I, I hope these numbers add some color to that, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Catherine to give you a little bit more of a breakdown on, you know, where we're at with the pebble mine uh, situation. Yeah, thank you so much, Andy, and thanks for covering the economic numbers. Reading that report was really exciting for me, but you, <laughs> this is what you do, so I appreciate you going through that. Um, Lindsay is actually going to cover the first part of this and then I'll chime in at the end here. Great. Yeah, thanks Kat and thanks Andy. Um, Andy, I know that your video is off now, but um, since you are screen sharing, I'll just direct you to go next slide with me. So thanks again for hosting that. But um, as, so Andy covered a lot of really good information about the economics and just how like, the true monetary, I mean more than monetary, but the monetary value of Bristol Bay and, and what it means to Alaskans and to people across the country, but 
as probably everybody listening here knows, it's also a hugely important place, you know, for the indigenous population of the region and all of Alaska. Um, and so, you know, I'm super grateful to be able to work for United Tribes of Bristol Bay, who has been um, pretty instrumental in a lot of that fight on the indigenous perspective. But as we get into kind of where we are now with um, with the call to protect Bristol Bay and the request, you know, basically requesting and demanding permanent protections for our region. Um, we're gonna cover a little bit of the events that have led up to where we are today. And I'll try not to get into too much detail because I know there's so much to cover, but Andy, if you don't mind just jumping to that next page, summary of major events, um, it's supposed to say 2020 there. So this is a very, very brief bullet point. And I know there's a lot of writing here, so we won't get into too much detail, but this is a very brief bullet point of some of the major stuff that has happened over the past year, just 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 greater than a year. Um, and it really I mean, I could go back even further because there's so much that has led up to where we are now. But if we look back into early 2020, we see that Pebble was still having major financial trouble. As everyone probably remembers, Pebble submitted their permit application to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in late 2017, almost immediately after the Trump administration um, went into office. So from there, we just saw this really big push, right, for them to kind of start steamrolling and g gaining momentum. Um, but they still weren't ever, ever able to secure a financial partner, which is a really, really important piece of this because they're touting such valuable, valuable gold and copper in the ground, but they were never able to secure funding, um, which really just proves that no one thinks this project was a good idea. Um, so anyway, we're moving through the permitting process. And actually in mid-summer last year, in July 2020, um, the Army Corps of Engineers released the, the final EIS, the final environmental impact statement. And that was a document that said, here's what we have assessed that's, that this project is going to impact. You know, from our position, after seeing how quickly the permitting process was sped through and how um, that it was such a lack of thoroughness with their evaluation of the permit, didn't really feel like that EIS was as comprehensive as it should have been. But it was released back in 2020, kind of in the summer when we were all out fishing or wrapping up our fishing seasons, um, which was which was a little bit of a spike for Pebble as we saw their stock prices kind of increased a little bit and they claimed that as a victory. But um, as we know today, you know, they, their permit was still denied, but that was kind of an event um, mid last year. And then as we move through the year, we did see a lot of, you know, support actually in in favor of Bristol Bay and saving Bristol Bay and protecting Bristol Bay. One list that you see there is House Appropriations, the United States Congress, the U.S. House Representatives. They voted to actually stop uh, to have the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers stop funding Pebble because they knew how kind of corrupt of a process the permanent the permitting process had been to date. And so that was kind of a big thing in the news a little bit. Um, another thing that we really saw in 2020, as we've seen for the last decade, is incredible amounts of support in favor of protecting Bristol Bay. But specifically in 2020 last year, we saw some really um, high profile people doing so. And I bet the print is pretty small for you all viewing, but underneath public support of Bristol Bay on this list here, we had uh, Donald Trump Jr., uh, Kix Brooks, Jane Fonda, uh, even Joe Biden, as he was a candidate at that point, um, all came out in favor of protecting Bristol Bay or opposing the proposed pebble mine which of course kind of um, led to a, another snowball effect of further garnering further support across the country. Um, another thing that we saw at, right before the permit decision, which I'm gonna talk about in a second, was that the US Army Corps of Engineers requested a compensatory mitigation plan um, that was a, a more comprehensive plan because the Pebble partnership didn't initially put forward a thorough enough one. So that was kind of an element that led to their permit being denied. Um, so I'll, I'm going to talk about the permit denial as after I talk about this next piece, which Andy will go to the pebble tape slide next. And just as a reminder, I know probably a lot of you are familiar with this, but in the fall of 2020, we also saw what was called the pebble tapes released by the Environmental Investigation Agency. And again, there's a lot of writing on this slide. Don't expect anybody to see to read it, but I think it is available at the CFBB booth um, for, for Kodiak Comfish. So be feel to feel free to check that out. But really the pebble tapes just revealed how incredibly corrupt this process has been and how the leaders at the Pebble Partnership were not doing justice to Alaskans and to the people of Bristol Bay and were really touting their political connectedness, were really touting their backdoor deals and um, basically revealed that they were going to make this a much bigger 
project that then they've been saying it's going to be you know we in the bristol bay have known that they're going to expand this far greater than 20 years and there's a much bigger footprint than it actually planned to be in the permit application and they revealed that in the pebble tapes so it was a pretty monumental moment um, and release of information that we saw at the end of 2020. And I think that if folks do want to watch those, they are on the Environmental Investigative, Investigative Agency website. To, so feel free to check those out. But in response to the pebble tapes, and we'll go to the next slide, Andy, in response to those tapes, we did see Alaska senators responding and taking a stand and speaking up for the people of Bristol Bay and for the need to, to secure permanent protections. As you can see, these two quotes here were really important and really critical statements by um, Senators Lisa Murkowski and Dan Sullivan. As you can see, uh, Senator Sullivan said, let me be even more clear, I oppose Pebble Mine, no Pebble Mine. He said that in late 2020. So that's kind of a big position and one that we're, we're excited to see action from both of our senators. And of course, um, Senator Murkowski said something similar. She actually called for long-term protections for the region, um, really understanding and recognizing the true value of the Bristol Bay region. Um, and Andy will go on to the next one as well. Again, just some more notes and quotes from Congress. Um, we saw senators and, Repu and uh, representatives from across the country who really stood up and said, look, this place is still as amazing as it's ever been. We're going to start to recognize and put this into like we saw um, with the House Amendment back in 2020. They're starting to make statements and recognizing just how valuable um, and important it is for Bristol Bay to secure long-term protections, which gets us into the action we're taking today. Um, but we'll move on again, and I'm trying again to keep this short and sweet because I know there's so much to cover. Um, but the, as I talked about, as I mentioned, eventually, right, the Pebble permit got denied in late 2020, in November of 2020, that U.S. Army Corps of Engineers permit, the federal permit needed to build um, to start to develop the public project was denied. And on the left of our screen there, it says the new compensatory mitigation plan. This is the plan that Pebble um, needed to put forward um, that basically wasn't enough to prove that they could properly and adequately mitigate that region or that those lands and waters for what they were going to um, be disrupting and polluting. But this all led to the record of decision or the ROD, the ROD. Um, and that was where the the Army Corps denied that permit. They said, look, you're not meeting these standards. This this project isn't in the public interest in the way you think it is. Um, the threat of mining is going to devastate our cultures, our economies, our communities, our environment, and it's simply not worth the risk. So that was a really welcome, though temporary measure that we saw in late 2020. Um, and I say temporary because, as you can see on the next slide, a decision like that can be appealed. And that's exactly what the Pebble Partnership did. As soon as they saw that their, their permit was not granted, that they didn't receive that 404 Clean Water Act permit, they appealed the decision. And we're not gonna talk about the state of Alaska appeal because that actually wasn't found to have any grounding. There was no standing in that appeal from the state of Alaska, but the appeal by the Pebble Partnership was deemed um, to have standing. And so they, the Army Corps is considering that. The appeal wasn't accepted in terms of like, we're granting the appeal, but it was accepted in terms of, we're gonna review the appeal and we'll come up with a decision sometime in mid 2020. So now the situation we're in is Pebble applied for a permit. The permit got denied. The Pebble partnership, the company in you know working towards it, they filed an appeal. And so now we're kind of in this limbo of like, the, the the appeal might be, you know, might be founded in truth, and they they might actually reverse the decision, or that an initial decision to deny the permit could stand. But we, what we really need is a really long term permanent solution. And we'll go to the next slide, Andy, before I turn it over to Cat here. But that solution is what the call to protect Bristol Bay is, right? We need something that's not going to work today or tomorrow or this month or even for a couple of years. We need something that's going to ensure that the security of Bristol, the Bristol Bay region lasts forever, that we have permanent protection for our lands, waters, fisheries, people, cultures um, now and for generations to come. So back in late 2020, at the end of last year, UTBB, along with other Bristol Bay partners, developed and published The Call to Protect Bristol Bay. And this is a two-part um, conceptual call, a conceptual ask that includes 
the EPA veto that we have, um, that the tribes of Bristol Bay region have been asking for for years, all the way since back since 2013. And this is the EPA 404C action that could restrict large scale mining like the Pebble Project in Bristol Bay. And the second part of that um, is a legislative approach, basically that Congress, United States Congress would introduce a bill and pass legislation that would protect the waters of Bristol Bay forever. So where we're at right now is really working on this EPA action, this agency action that would, um, that the EPA would take to basically stop in their tracks, Pebble and a project like it from moving forward. And there's a lot of details there. Again, I think we're going to have hopefully a couple minutes for questions. And if not, more information for this is available on our website and Defend Bristol Bay. But um, there's a lot of work yet to be done. And so although that permit got denied, we're not finished yet. And I know I've been just talking at you all for a good 10 minutes now. So I'm going to turn it back over to Catherine um, to talk about how we are going to work to get there and what it takes for you all and for the people on the ground to make sure that the call to protect Bristol Bay comes to fruition. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Lindsay. And I'll, I'll try to be quick too, because I really do want to leave time for questions. So Andy, if you just want to hop to that next slide. Um, really, as soon as the call to protect Bristol Bay was released, um, groups, businesses, organizations from across the country started piling on, and which was very exciting to see and exactly what we need to keep momentum up to really keep this a priority for um, the Biden administration and for the EPA to really take action. So last I checked, there are over 240 businesses and organizations signed on representing literally millions of Americans supporting this call for permanent protections. And I'll, I'll paste all these links in the chat box, but if you if you wanna check out all the groups that are a part of this, um, it's not, they're all housed at stoppublemindnow.org. But I'd, I'll get into what you can do in a second, but if you just take a glance at this slide, and, and we also have this available at the CFPB booth, if you don't see your business or your processor or, or you know, or a commercial fishing business that you think would want to be a part of this call. I've thrown a few of the logos up there, but just take a look at the website. And if you don't see your business or processor up there, um, forward, forward this on to them and really ask them to join this call because it's it's what we need to build the momentum for this. And Andy, if you want to just flip to the next one, I don't know why I thought uh, the full verbiage of Section 404C of the Clean Water Act was necessary to put in a slide, but I, I think I'll just breeze through this. Really, most of you who have been following this issue probably have 404C memorized. <laughs> so just a quick refresher on the actual authority that EPA has. Step one of the call, like like Lindsay mentioned, is this 404C action. And I think the only, the only important thing to emphasize here is that EPA really truly has this authority at any time, but there has never been a time before where we had more information and where even the Army Corps' findings in their permit denial points more to a 404C action here. So, you know, if, if discharge of mine waste is found to have unacceptable adverse impacts on fisheries, a 404C action is warranted and especially to protect a fishery as important as Bristol Bay. So I just wanted to throw that reminder up there. Um, it's been debated in the past if, this authority applied and there is there is zero doubt that it applies now and that now is the absolute best time for it to take place. So I think we'll just hop to the next slide. What can you do? I'll leave, I'll, I'll just rush through this a little bit and open it up to Q&A because um, I know we're getting short on time, but really just keeping the pressure up and keeping this issue in focus. As Lindsay said, um, President or then candidate Biden said that he supported protections for Bristol Bay, but as we all know, there are a lot of issues in your first 100 days in office, and we haven't yet seen the action we've been requested, which is really the initiation of an EPA veto for Pebble Mine. We haven't seen that enacted yet, and as experience shows us, this isn't like an executive order. This isn't something that can happen overnight. It's something that really is a process, and it takes time. So until this action is started we we really truly need to keep the pressure up so any phone calls um to your representatives and senators you can make we threw them their phone numbers up on the slides there and just really keeping keeping the drumbeat going and keeping the momentum going on this by joining the call and i'll paste i'll paste all those links in there and then at the cfbb booth we have links to join the call to protect bristol bay so if you haven't already please check that out and and join onto the call and really i i would just add i think if 2020 showed us anything this really has proved that 
this is not a partisan issue. Protecting Bristol Bay is what all Alaskans want. And so I think just remaining focused on this and spreading the word and, and helping educate anyone who might be new to the issue that, that this is about protecting an existing way of life and an existing industry that really is so important to all Alaskans. Um, and Sarah, I don't know if, are you, if you're gonna throw questions or if any questions have popped up yet in the chat. Yeah, so we have had a question. Really, you've, you've just covered it, but if you wanna reiterate really specifically on, um, we, we had a question from Michael Jackson and he asks, as leaders and spokespeople for your organizations and communities, what is one concrete thing that listen, listeners can do to aid and assist in the development and implementation of permanent protections for Bristol Bay? Well, I'll start. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, and yeah, I think as as Lindsay and Catherine said, uh, just make sure that our our elected officials understand how important Bristol Bay is, uh, you know, to you individually, um, to your community, to your business. You know, things from local resolutions um, that recognize the importance of Bristol Bay salmon, you know, either culturally or economically. Um, you know, social media posts, and again, make sure you at your uh, representative, phone calls, letters, emails, um, and frankly, emails usually work better than actually written letters. Um, you know, just letting them know from as many places as possible. And I, I think the Alaska delegation um, has been, you know, really good on this issue, and they've taken a very strong stance against Pebble. Um, you know, but like, like Lindsay said, we need permanent protections for this, um, not temporary ones. And so the more voices that can be raised from more places, the better. And so if you know fishermen in Alabama, or if you know people that uh, like Bristol Bay Sockeye in Colorado or Michigan, uh, you know, wherever, um, this really shouldn't just be a Western Alas Alaska issue. Um, and I and it shouldn't be seen as that you know, this fishery uh, just affects so many people in so many places. Um, and it's really important that our elected leaders understand that. So um, Catherine and Lindsay, any any other tips there for folks who want to join the cause that you haven't mentioned? Yeah, I, I think you covered it there, Andy, but I, I would just add to, I think, I mean, we've, we've seen clearly that, that this new administration prioritizes conservation, has climate change as, as a central um, priority. But I, I think it's really important. And I think commercial fishermen are are going to be very important voices in making sure that this is done right. And and really there isn't an example out there better than action in Bristol Bay than Clean Water Act protections for Bristol Bay that that are something that works there. It's It could be deemed as conservation, but it also works with the people who live there with the way of life that lives, that exists there and with an economy. And, and so I think for those of you who are part of any of these ongoing conversations with with really any agency in this new administration, I think it's really important to to highlight that and, and throw Bristol Bay up as an example and Clean Water Act protections up as an example of how, how to do it right. Okay, it looks like we have time for just one more question. And this one comes to us from S Sam Snyder. You said this isn't an executive order, but can you clarify the Biden administration can quickly instruct EPA to start this process? Can you elaborate more there? Yeah, Kat, do you want me to take a first stab at that? Yeah, so it's not an executive order. This is an agency action by the Environmental Protection Agency, right? This isn't this isn't President Biden saying that pebble can never happen. This is the Environmental Protection Agency that after years of research, like we saw in the 2014 Bristol Bay Watershed Assessment, has taken a really big view, really big picture of this environment and this ecosystem and this fishery, the monetary economic value, the people and the land and the region, and saying, okay, we need to establish some protections for this because this project and the scope of this project are simply, simply don't add up for something that's gonna be effective in the long term for the Bristol Bay region, right? And so it's not a sole action by the president, it's actually the Environmental Protection Agency with in consultation with tribes, with 
Department of Interior, with BLM, with lots of other um, groups and organizations across the country who take really, you know, a dynamic approach at, at putting in place protections under the Clean Water Act, the 404C section of the Clean Water Act. So I'm not sure if that helps answer or kind of separate the two. Kat, feel free to jump in and add some clarifying points if, if we need to. No, I, I, think, I think that's right, Lindsay. And I think part of the reason I brought that up, you know, a lot of us I personally probably wish that there could be a magic wand wave, but like Lindsay said, this is a, this is a scientific process and that really will be what makes long-term protections more durable. But I, I think I mentioned it too, just to highlight that it, it can't happen overnight. It is, there is a timeline associated and allowing, I, th I think it's the reason we need to keep pressure up and, and make sure that this happens soon so that we don't run out the clock. I mean, this, we, we came very near to final protections for Bristol Bay in 2014 and then um, the clock ran out on that administration and, and we can't afford to have that happen again. So just, just keeping the pressure up until we really do see a process started. Thank you so much. I think that's going to cover us. We've, we've hit our time limit. And so of course, if any attendees have any additional questions, you can see Lindsay, Catherine and Andy's information right there on the, um, the screen there. So at this point in time, I'd like to say, you know, a huge thank you to Andy, Lindsay and Catherine. Clearly, there's still a lot to be aware of out in Bristol Bay. And so for everyone else, we are going to be transitioning really quick to that state legislative update. And so we'll be with you back with you in just a minute. Thanks so much for joining us again. Thank you.